Good evening. Welcome to the Texas Underground Railroad Public Open House hosted by the National Park Service in collaboration with the Organization of American Historians. For tonight's event, we are using Zoom's webinar format, which means all attendees video and audio will be turned off for the entirety of the session. We welcome and encourage your questions for our scholars. In order to submit questions at any time during the roundtable, simply type them into the Q&A box located in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The last half hour or so of the session will be dedicated to questions and answers moderated by our chair. Please use the question and answer box rather than the chat box for questions. It's my esteemed pleasure to introduce uh, Robert Bob Stanton, who served as the 15th uh, Director of the National Park Service from August 4th, 1997 to January of 2001. During his tenure as director, Bob oversaw the designation and establishment of the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom Program. Please join me in welcoming Bob Stanton. Good evening. Thank you very much to Diane for that very kind uh, introduction. I want to uh, welcome you ladies and gentlemen uh, to this open house in which we will explore some research and other findings of the National Park Service's Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. And in this light, I want to extend a special greeting to the youth who honor us with their attendance and participation in this open house. We look forward to speaking with you about the National Park Service Underground Railroad Network to Freedom, which was authorized by an act of Congress in 1998. We appreciate this grand opportunity to share ideas and to share our knowledge and the findings from the research with a team of scholars who have examined the Underground Railroad in my home state of Texas. The Network to Freedom supports scholarship and stewardship of the Underground Railroad and associated resources. Over the past few days, a panel of scholars have participated in round table discussions. Tonight, they will share some key observations from those discussions about research on enslaved people's individual courage and actions to capitalize on political opportunities, actions that they hope will lead them to full freedom, to full freedom. We hope this open house will help build connections and lead to a new, opp new opportunities for collaboration and cooperation to better support the preservation and stewardship of this rich and enduring history in our respective communities. The history of the Underground Railroad and its legacy provides, from my perspective, lessons and encouragement for today as we confront many, many challenges in achieving full freedom, justice, diversity, equity, inclusion, and dignity for all. Please permit me, if you will, a moment to recognize and thank those who have made this evening's program possible. The Organization of American Historians, particularly Director of Public History Program, Paul Sarecki, for his organization work and organized both the Scholars Roundtable and the Public Open House event. The Park Service has enjoyed for a number of years an outstanding relationship with the Organization of American Historians. Also, I want to thank Yale University Professor of History and American Studies, Stephen Pitty, who too has been a strong champion of the national parks and programs of the National Park Service, wearing a number of different hats. And, and for this occasion, Steve has provided thoughtful questions and moderation as a chair of the roundtable discussions and tonight's event. And certainly, and certainly, our distinguished scholars for sharing their insights and research with all of us who will be participating in a conversation and discussion on their research and the findings and and hopefully some of their conclusions that will guide us in strengthening our resolve to better support the preservation of the Underground Railroad. Again, thank each of you for your attendance and participation in tonight's open house. And I would be remiss if I did not personally salute Diane Miller, Dr. Diane Miller, who is the National Program Manager for the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom, who continues to do a magnificent job and Diane, we're all grateful for your leadership and support. Ladies and gentlemen, Diane. Thank you, Bob. Um, 
I, th I think your leadership and support has been outstanding. So I, I rely on it. Um, Juneteenth dominates the public memory surrounding slavery and freedom in Texas, yet the struggle for freedom began much earlier than the arrival of U.S. troops in Galveston on June 19, 1865. The struggle for freedom began with the Underground Railroad. While different meanings have been attached to the term Underground Railroad in different times and places, when the Net Network to Freedom uses the term, it is to reference attempts to escape chattel slavery through flight and or assist others in that escape. These escapes and attempts lasted from the beginning of slavery in America in colonial times until the end of legal slavery in the United States. And they happened in the North, the South, the West and the East in what is now the United States. People who sought freedom are at the center of this story because there is no underground railroad without freedom seekers. The National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom Program, as Bob mentioned, was established by legislation in 1998, and it directed the National Park Service to commemorate and honor the Underground Railroad as a crucial element in the evolution of the nation's civil rights movement. Our mission, through collaboration with local, state, and federal entities, as well as individuals and organizations, is to honor, preserve, and promote the history of resistance to enslavement through escape and flight which continues to inspire people worldwide. Through its mission, the National Park, the Network to Freedom helps to advance the idea that all human beings embrace the right to self-determination and freedom from oppression. The program is a catalyst for innovation, partnerships and scholarships that connects and shares the diverse legacy of the Underground Railroad across boundaries and generations. The legislation identified three components to the program to ed educate the public, to provide technical assistance, and to create a network of historical sites, interpretive and educational programs, and research facilities that have a verifiable connection to the Underground Railroad. As of June in 2021, there are 680 members of this network spanning 39 states, DC, and the Virgin Islands. We add more members to the network twice a year. As the Network to Freedom gather these documented local stories of the Underground Railroad, a new understanding of this multiracial resistance movement has emerged. The Underground Railroad represents one of the earliest grassroots movements in this country in which people united across racial, gender, religious, and class lines in hopes of promoting social change. While allies assisted in journeys to freedom, the Underground Railroad is centered on the enslaved people who resisted their status and self-liberated. Without freedom seekers, there would be no Underground Railroad. When asked by Underground Railroad activist Calvin Fairbank why he wanted his freedom, for example, Lewis Hayden replied, because I am a man. While many date the Underground Railroad as starting in the 1830s when railroad terminology became common, enslaved people began self-liberating from the earliest colonial period. Slavery existed almost everywhere in the United States, including the North, so the Underground Railroad was not confined to one geographical area, and as the country expanded west, so did the Underground Railroad. While Canada was Lewis Hayden's destination, others included Spanish Florida, the Caribbean, and Mexico, and other countries elsewhere. Some freedom seekers escaped to maroon communities. A few of these communities were near plantations where family members lived. Native American tribes often provided protection and assistance. For example, some freedom seekers allied with the Seminole tribe and fought alongside them in the Seminole Wars before joining the Trail of Tears to Indian Territory and subsequently escaping to Mexico under the leadership of John Horse. As the Cotton South expanded westward, enslaved people from Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi sought, sought their freedom in Mexico where slavery was fully outlawed in 1837. Before the end of the Civil War in 1865, thousands of self-liberators sought their freedom in free states and territories in Canada, Mexico, and elsewhere. These journeys required courage, determination, and creativity. Some used disguises, others shipped themselves in box to allies, and through involvement in the maritime industry, some enslaved people found their freedom in Caribbean nations, California, and even Hawaii. Knowing who to trust in their journeys to freedom was a crucial skill. The most important allies in these quests for freedom were free black communities. 
many of which developed along the borders with slave states. White allies also assisted in this resistance movement, often in connection with their affiliation with religious congregations. We are here this week because we understand that the Underground Railroad looked different in different parts of the country at different periods of time. Despite the secret nature of the Underground Railroad, documents do exist to verify these stories. This week, the MPS hosted a scholars roundtable to explore the latest scholarship about enslaved people who sought their freedom in the Texas borderlands. I will now hand the program over to Stephen Pitty and our panel of scholars. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Um, and hi, everybody. Um, my name is Stephen Pitty, and I'm a professor of history and American studies at Yale University. Um, it's been my real pleasure to participate in recent days uh, in some of the conversations convened by NPS related to freedom seekers in Texas. So let me take a moment um, on behalf of the panelists um, who are here to thank everyone involved, uh, not only in today's event, but in the terrific scholars roundtables and discussions that have been convened in recent days, uh, including Director Stanton, Dr. Miller, and everyone involved in the Network to Freedom, as well as the great people in the Organization of American Historians and others. I'm gonna to serve today as moderator of our conversation, which features, as has already been said, <clears throat> some amazing scholars from around the United States who've done critical research and broken new interpretive ground related to slavery, to freedom seekers in Texas who sought to escape slavery, to the history of Mexico and to other related topics. So over the next 30 or 40 minutes, I'm gonna be asking them some questions about their research on the Underground Railroad <clears throat> and about freedom seeking in the Texas region. This is the portion of the evening in which we'll all learn about ongoing scholarship on the Underground Railroad in Texas. So as you listen to them, uh, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, towards the end of this session, I'll turn to those questions and I'll do my best to ask the scholars to comment on as many of them as they can. And I'll apologize in advance if we don't get to your question, but we'll be doing our best to be responsive uh, in that latter uh, section of our conversation. Uh, let me introduce our panelists briefly in alphabetical order. Michaela Audain is an associate professor in the history department at the College of New Jersey, where she teaches African-American history courses. She earned her PhD in history from Rutgers University, New Brunswick, her research interests include slavery and freedom in Texas, fugitives from slavery who escaped to Mexico, and the experiences of black people on the US-Mexico borderlands. She's currently finishing a book about freedom seekers from Louisiana and Texas who escaped to Mexico between 1804 and 1865. Roseanne Bacha Garza is a lecturer of anthropology at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, where she also serves as the program manager of the Community Historical Archaeology Project with schools, otherwise known as the CHAPS program. She was a 2020 nominee for the University of Texas Regents Outstanding Teaching Award and for the UTRGV Faculty Excellence Award in Community Engaged Scholarship. She's co-author of a book called Blue and Gray on the Border, the Rio Grande Valley Civil War Trail, and she's co-editor of The Civil War on the Rio Grande, 1846 to 1876. She's dedicated to cultural heritage preservation and community-engaged scholarship along the US-Mexico borderlands, where her research interests lie in African-American families in antebellum South Texas, Civil War era history, and Native American peoples of South Texas. Alice Baumgartner, is an assistant professor of history at the University of Southern California. She holds a PhD from Yale University and an MPhil in Latin American Studies from the University of Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. Her first book, South to Freedom, Runaway Slaves to Mexico and the Road to the Civil War, was selected as an editor's choice by the New York Times Book Review and as a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize in History. Jane Landers is the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Professor of History at Vanderbilt University. She is director of the Slave Society's Digital Archive 
and of Vanderbilt's International Initiative for the Study of Slave Societies. Since 2015, she has served as the US member of UNESCO's International Scientific Committee for the Slave Route Project. Lander's award-winning monographs include Black Society in Spanish Florida and Atlantic Creoles in the Age of Revolutions. And she is the co-author or editor of five other books. Andrew J. Torgett is a historian of 19th century North America at the University of North Texas, where he holds the University Distinguished Teaching Professorship. His most recent book is Seeds of Empire, Cotton, Slavery, and the Transformation of the Texas Borderlands, 1800 to 1850, which won numerous book prizes and awards, including the David J. Weber Clements Center Prize for Best Nonfiction Book on Southwestern America from the Western Historical Association. Thank you all panelists for being here. And as, as promised, we're gonna spend some time here talking about some questions that we've been discussing uh, in recent days as a group and that we thought made some sense uh, to talk through yet again uh, in the presence uh, of the audience today. So first, I wanna ask you all to, to think about the question of the importance of the history that we're talking about today. Why is it important in your view to understand the history of freedom seeking in 19th century Texas? And what did the Underground Railroad look like in Texas? Michaela, would you like to get us started? Sure. So um, one of the things about uh, looking at freedom seeking in 19th century Texas is that it pushes back against this notion that the North was always this safe haven and that everybody who escaped and tried to get North we're seeing uh, Texas uh, slavery existed because as gradual emancipation, um, talks about gradual emancipation in the North were happening at the same time slavery was spreading farther or deeper South and eventually West to Texas. So for some people, if you're enslaved in Texas, like just getting to Philadelphia wasn't really feasible. It would be really difficult. So Mexico, um, and when it abolished uh, slavery, um, made it um, made it a bit more uh, feasible and possible for enslaved Texans to escape there, as opposed to making it uh, all the way uh, to the north. And also looking at uh, this history, it raises uh, or looks at the national um, and international implications of U.S. slavery and these uh, these escapes. So unlike um, you know, people escaping within the United States. Um, when enslaved Texans escaped to Mexico, that uh, created lots of international issues and uh, back and forth between the US and Mexican governments about what to do about the arrival of enslaved Texans. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and say, I agree with all of that. And I, I think that for me, when you talk about the Underground Railroad in Texas, I think it forces us to acknowledge and have a real conversation about the history of slavery in Texas, which I think is still underappreciated and, and a little under understood. Um, and, and really focuses the light, I think, on the, the large number of men, women, and children who were enslaved in Texas and resisted that in all kinds of different ways. And many of whom took uh, incredible risks to try to seize freedom for themselves and their families. Um, and, and it makes us, talk about and understand, I think, you know, the, the sacrifices and the realities and these bigger stories, as Michaela was talking about, that connects Texas to the United States and to Mexico and, and how these people ended up, you know, 230,000 of them by the time you get to the end of the American Civil War um, within Texas. But it also has this talk and think, I think, about the situation in Texas itself. Um, the Underground Railroad, as if we want to call it that, in Texas doesn't look like what I grew up thinking about the Underground Railroad. When I was a kid, um, I would think of the Underground Railroad as a place that had prescribed stops and set routes and things like that that people could follow if they were trying to escape to the north or Canada for freedom. Um, you asked, you know, what does the Underground Railroad look like in Texas? It, it doesn't look anything like that in Texas. It looks like individuals making individual choices sometimes by themselves, sometimes in groups, sometimes over land, sometimes on waterways, sometimes hopping on a ship in Galveston or Matagorda Bay that's bound for somewhere else. Um, 
and, and everything in between. And I think that's one of the things that makes the Texas case so very interesting because it gives us a, a broad sense of the diversity, not just of the people and the circumstances in which people find themselves, but the, the diversity of the experiences that people had in running to freedom, whether it was to Mexico or north out of Texas or east back into the, the rest of the Southern United States by the time you get to the 1850s and, and everything in between. Thank you, Alice. One of the parts about this history that I find so fascinating is the way in which it changes our understandings of abolition and anti-slavery. That most of the time for most of us, when we think about the history of freedom and slavery in the world, we think about the Northern United States, about Canada, about Britain, about France, increasingly about Haiti. We don't often think about Mexico, but Mexico was a destination for freedom seekers in many respects because of the laws that were passed by the Mexican government that were radical for the time. In the wake of Mexico's independence movement, which took place between 1810 and 1821, uh, seven of Mexico's 19 states abolished slavery outright. Nine of those states also passed gradual emancipation laws of the variety that were passed in states like Pennsylvania, New York, and Connecticut. And Mexico abolished slavery in 1837, well in advance of the United States. And if you're thinking, I thought it was 1829, I'd be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A as the other panelists can as well. And Mexico didn't stop there. In 1857, it adopted a constitution that not only enshrined the abolition of slavery, but also promised freedom to all enslaved people who set foot on its soil from the moment they arrived. And that really changes, I think, not just our view about abolition, the process of, of abolition more broadly, but it also changes our view about Mexico a country that unfortunately we often hear about in the news primarily because of poverty, corruption, violence, drugs, people crossing the border. And I think this gives us a more complex and also a more accurate understanding of Mexico and its connections to the United States. Thank you, Alice. You know, Jane, you brought to these conversations deep expertise in the history of the Southeast and um, the stories there. Any reflections from your point of view about what the Texas case looks like when we keep Florida in mind? Well, uh, yes, thank you. All my colleagues are doing such wonderful work in Texas. And so I'm sort of the odd person out a little bit earlier, a couple centuries earlier and on another part of the geography, but there's so many uh, connections between the Spanish legal system that happened as early uh, as the 17th century for offering freedom to enslaved people who would cross an international border and come to the Spanish side. Uh, so legal precedents are there, um, the same sort of patterns of uh, communities moving together across the border and in small groups and forming communities on the other side, uh, and also engagement in the military uh, efforts of Spain. Uh, so some of these patterns are very familiar to me, even though they happen later and in another part of our what became the United States. Thank you. You know, there's been a real flowering of work on these topics as represented by those of you on the panel, of course. We also talked over the course of the last couple of days about the fact that there is previous research on some of these topics. And so you are building on the work of, of past scholars and past experts and past communities who've invested, invested a lot of energy into uh, understanding these histories. From your vantage point, um, in the 2020s. Um, what in your view are some of the opportunities uh, as well as the challenges for understanding and telling these histories of the Texas region um, today? Alice, maybe I'll go back to you with this question. One of the biggest challenges for historians of slavery are sources. That it's really hard to find sources told from the perspective of enslaved people. And that in the United States, we can get at that perspective by doing what scholars call reading against the grain, looking at documents that were created in courts, that were created by enslavers who obviously had their own agendas to push, as well as by abolitionists who also had 
a very different agenda, but an agenda nonetheless. I think one of the really exciting opportunities of studying in, or freedom seekers in the US-Mexico borderlands is the ability to draw on sources from Mexico, Spanish sources that are now increasingly uh, easy to access because of you know, revolutions and transportation and the circulation of finding aids and the organization of these archives. One of, Steve, you mentioned earlier historians, Kenneth Wiggins Porter, who was really a pioneer of African-American history in the West, went to Nacimiento de los Negros, which is a town in Northern Coahuila where the descendants of black Seminoles still live and conducted oral histories and in his papers, there are letters describing how long it took for him to get to this community, whereas now it's much, much easier. But the main reason why I think that getting into those Spanish sources is so important is because it allows us to see things that we don't get to see when we're just looking at U.S. sources. And I want to give just one example, one story that I found really nothing about it in US archives, but I found a lot about it in the records of the Mexican consul in Mexico, Francisco Pizarro Martinez. These are all letters that are in the foreign relations archive in Mexico City. In 1835, there was an enslaved man named Jean Antoine who somehow hid himself in the hold of a ship that was bound for Campeche, Mexico. The ship was far from New Orleans by the time that the crew and the captain started to suspect that there was someone on board. But as much as they searched for Jean Antoine, they couldn't find him. But by the time that they reached the port, they were able to ask the mayor of Campeche to send the police to find the stowaway in their ship. And Jean Antoine was arrested. In 1835, Mexico hadn't abolished slavery yet, and the port authorities of Campeche resolved to return him to Louisiana. Unfortunately, this is not a happy ending to the story of Jean Antoine's ingenuity and resourcefulness hiding himself on that ship. He's returned on the next ship bound back to New Orleans, who happens to be captained by a Mexican citizen who had been accused the previous year of helping an enslaved person escape from Louisiana to the Mexican coast. This time, that captain didn't help Jean Antoine escape. But when Jean Antoine was unloaded from the ship in New Orleans, he did pull out a dagger that no one had known. And we really don't know, I have any idea where that dagger came from, whether the Mexican captain gave it to him or he had found it from some, through some other means. But before he was given over to his owner, he took the dagger and stabbed himself and unfortunately died the next day. That story is so heart-wrenching no matter how many times I have told, written about it or told it. And we would not know about it if it weren't for those consular records describing it, not from Jean Antoine's perspective. Unfortunately, we don't have access to that as far as I've been able to find, but at least we have a testament to Jean Antoine's determination to escape slavery by any means necessary. Alice, thank you for sharing that story, which I think is such a great example of the some of the possibilities um, that are there in the Mexican archives, as you say, that you were able to use so well in, in your book. And I, I, you know, for me too, that story of Jean Antoine is just um, so powerful. Your story also reminds us, I think, that um, some of the migration that we're talking about in this region was not only terrestrial, it was also um, across water, um, and in your case, uh, the Gulf Coast, uh, but also, of course, across, across the river. And so with that in mind, Roseanne, I thought I might turn to you um, and ask, you know, from your perspectives, perspective, uh, where you're located and in the work that you do, what, what do you see as some of the opportunities and challenges for understanding and telling this history? Well, in, down here in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, um, we do have some sources. We do have, um, you know, archival uh, items and whatnot. But the 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 challenges are, uh, like Alice said, the primary sources here in Texas uh, are really fewer and farther between than what um, my colleagues have been finding during their archival research in Mexico. Uh, one of the things we were discussing earlier today is, is how efficient uh, the Spanish and the Mexican governments were at interviewing these escaped slaves that made it across the border. 
uh, so they could so they could get their stories. Um, uh, but another thing that we talked about was um, the perspective of uh, an enslaved person seeking freedom and getting their story without bias um, put on there as well. So when we, one of the sources that I've, I've looked into are the uh, WPA uh, or the Works Progress Administration um, conducted by the um, US government during the Great Depression, the Federal Writers Project. Uh, did a, a big project about collecting slave narratives. And so some of those uh, slave narratives do talk directly about um, uh, freedom seekers uh, traversing Texas and, and, and seeking freedom in Mexico. Um, so some of those sources are um, are, you know, when we talked about them being interviewed when they were in their 90s, many, many decades after they were slaves, you know, what was their, what was their memory like? In one case, um, a, a slave named Sally Rowe was recalling her father and her uncle telling a story about them uh, driving uh, cotton wagons down uh, through the Nuesa Strip to uh, the borderland region uh, near uh, Brownsville, and then simply placing um, a bale of cotton in the water, all four men hopping on it, grabbing a stick and rowing to freedom across the river. Um, that was a little bit more of a romanticized story because I, I think we can all agree that a bale of cotton would sink uh, straight to the bottom of the river uh, uh, in, in, in that aspect. So, um, we have to be careful about uh, what we what we read and what we find. Um, the other challenge is, is that because there are so there are so few uh, sources that, that that we can really rely upon because of the simple activity. Well, it wasn't a simple activity, but the action of an enslaved person escaping uh, their captivity and, and, and seeking freedom. Uh, in another country was it, it was illegal for them to leave their plantations and there were laws in place that would have um, prosecuted anybody who would assist them. And so um, there are plenty of, of stories out there by let's say German immigrants or other European immigrants who were witness to you know horrific uh, beatings and, and horrible treatment of, of slaves in, in, in Texas, for example. Uh, and at some point in time, and I don't know if it was right before Texas got their independence from, from Mexico or right after that there, there was uh, a time in which they were um, not, not allowing freed Africans uh, or African-Americans into Texas. And then they were going to be, um, instilling a $5,000 fine for anybody caught assisting them. And then of course, there are other stories where the, um, uh, those who were assisting a, a, a runaway slave would be hanged on the spot. Um, and then, you know, others were just so uh, afraid for their lives, they just wanted to escape Texas altogether. So um, because it was, you know, the activity had uh, had strong, strong penalties against it. It wasn't something that people were actively writing down. Uh, in fact, a, a Belgian astronomer named Jean-Claude uh, Rousseau, who was trying to, quote unquote, escape Texas, uh, also had, had compiled a lot of papers uh, for research and decided to burn them. Uh, in fear of getting caught for what he was writing down. Um, so, and, and, and as witness to what he saw and was just um, so horrified at what he saw. So the, the, the actual products uh, that we could search for and find are not as readily accessible as we would like them to be. So as historians, we are challenged to piece together the stories based on what we have found.
Thank you, Roseanne. Um, Michaela, any thoughts on this question about the opportunities and challenges for understanding and telling this history in the Texas region? Right, so for fugitive, uh, for fugitives from slavery, most did not want to be found. So um, for people who never left behind any written records or wrote or dictated their, um, their narrative to someone, like they've disappeared from the record, which is sort of what they wanted to do so that they could successfully escape. So um, uh, as we talked about uh, earlier, like one of the questions we get is how many people escaped? And so it's really hard for us to answer this question because of these uh, limitations from the, the sources and uh, how people maintain their freedom. Uh, one opportunity I've noticed, um, so uh, usually the discussion about slavery is a north-south binary. So we're moving to Texas, which already uh, um, adds depth to the study of US slavery, uh, but also uh, for African American history, particularly, um, you have to use, as Alice mentioned, we have to use Spanish language sources to tell this history. And in African American history, most people still use just English sources um, to uh, write their histories. And so thinking about how using non English sources can enhance the, the study of African American history and US history is um, one of the great things about this project. I think that's exactly right. Thank you. Thank you for bringing up all of those points, panelists. Let me turn to a new question, which is, of course, related, but um, it asks us in a different sense to contextualize this regional history in, in broader national or even international um, histories. You know, in your view, uh, panelists, how does this history of Texas, this Texas or the Texas region fit into but also challenge our understanding of broader histories of the United States and Mexico. For example, history of slavery as we understand them, you know, nationally or, or internationally, histories of anti-slavery, history of the Civil War, um, and more. Anything else you want to point to? Andrew, maybe I'll go to you first. Yeah. Well, hearkening back to the conversation we just had about sources in the United States and Mexico, I think the, the thing that we need to remember when working on these, these projects is that by their very nature, we have to understand both US history and Mexican history and the deep complexities of both to really get the broader story about what's happening in the United States with Texas being the western edge of the south and what's going on in Mexico with anti-slavery legislation, attitudes, things like that, and the connections between those. And I, I think that's where we have a lot of opportunities of overlap in thinking about how Texas is this sort of center of a Venn diagram between these two areas that challenges how we think about these histories, right? And I think it forces us too to think differently about Texas, at least differently than the way I think most Texans have thought about themselves, which is primarily Western and its moment of identity, if it has one, is the Republic of Texas, which kind of seems outside almost of US history. Um, but to, to, to contextualize all that, we need to understand that Texas is a part of these broad developments across North America, right? Um, why are enslaved people being brought to Texas even before it's a part of the United States? It's because of the cotton uh, revolution of the 18 teens that brings hundreds of thousands of people to the Mississippi River Valley and creates the Deep South, the places we typically think of when we think of slavery and the runaway slave phenomenon and things like that. Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, places like that. Texas is an extension of that, right? When we think of Stephen F. Austin, when we think of the old 300, as they're called, that originally comes into Texas, these people are bringing the cotton economy with them and they're bringing slavery with them. From the very beginning of, of American colonization in what is by then Northern Mexico. And, and so the story is about the, the expansion of slavery across borders, as these people are leaving the United States and bringing cotton and slavery into Northern Mexico. And then slave people who are being brought across these borders are navigating those questions themselves and always looking for freedom and opportunities. And so when, when things happen in Mexico, uh, anti-slavery legislation is passed, they're aware of those things and they take advantage when they can. Um, and so when we talk about things like the Texas Revolution, when we talk about the results of that, which is the creation of the Republic of Texas, we need to put that into the broader context that Texas is a part of this cotton explosion that's transforming again the American South, but also now Northern Mexico. And African Americans are in the midst of all of that, just like they are in Louisiana and Mississippi. Um, 
And so when we have something like the Republic of Texas that emerges, I always call the Republic of Texas everything the Confederacy wanted to be, but never had a chance to actually become. Um, because the Confederacy loses their war for independence, but Texas wins theirs. And for nine whole years, they try out this idea of having an independent nation dedicated to cotton and therefore slavery. And so the enslaved population of Texas, when it rises in the 1830s and 1840s, you have also an expansion um, of runaways. And then after Texas joins the United States, that phenomenon becomes an issue for the United States to deal with. But once again, what's happening in Mexico is influencing what's happening in the United States. And having that broader perspective, I think, gives us a much deeper context and understanding, not just way for why slaves are running away, but why it matters in a bigger sense. And really it's- helpful. Alice, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. It certainly mattered in a bigger sense in the wake of the US war with Mexico and the coming of the US Civil War. And the reason for that is really twofold. The first reason is that Mexico, by passing these really radical anti-slavery laws that as Andrew and Michaela and others have mentioned was drawing freedom seekers to Mexico, that that terrified enslavers that as Andrew mentioned, were coming into Texas in large numbers. And historians have recognized the ways in which the underground railroad to the North, the escape route to the North was a threat to slavery in the South, even though by some estimates, it was less than one half of 1% of enslaved people in the South that actually were able to escape beyond the Mason-Dixon line. And historians have also recognized the role that Haiti played after its uprising revolution in 1791 and the abolition of slavery at the end of that revolution, that that promise of a black republic was also terrifying to enslavers and it contributed to the sense of slavery being encircled by freedom and threatened by freedom in, to the North and through uh, the Caribbean to the South. But Mexico had passed many of the same laws and it didn't lay 500 miles by sea from the southernmost tip of Florida. It directly bordered the U.S. South, which, as Andrew has really convincingly shown, includes Texas. So it's part of this larger story of the anxieties of enslavers in the lead up to the Civil War. And it's also important because of the debates over the status of slavery in those territories that the United States seized from Mexico as a result of the US war with Mexico. Historians long have dated the sort of acceleration of sectional controversy to the US war with Mexico, but often overlook the fact that the reason why that territorial acquisition was so controversial was that it was the first time in US history that the United States had acquired territory where slavery was explicitly abolished by law. And Northern politicians of both political parties refused to reestablish slavery where it had previously been abolished. They thought the constitution didn't allow them to, they thought it was against morality, they thought that it was going to repeat the sins that Great Britain had committed against the early United States. Mexico's anti-slavery laws the same laws that were drawing freedom seekers across uh, the, the Rio Grande were really important, I think, to understanding the coming of the Civil War in the United States and the sectional controversy that really we cannot understand US history if we don't also understand Mexican history. That's helpful. Jane, what do you think about when you think about the ways these Texas histories contribute to our understanding of broader histories? Well, um, I, I'm really starting a little bit earlier, quite a bit earlier. Um, again, just to make the point that from the Florida coast to California, the whole Southern tier of our country was quite different than what everybody is more used to in their American history classes or their studies of the US South. So when I think South, I'm thinking Spanish the whole way. And I'm thinking of the uh, eventual engagement with the US government as well, when Thomas Jefferson as Secretary of State tries to stop 
the refuge in Spanish Florida and says to Spain, we helped you out with your revolution. If you don't want to be friends anymore, keep it up and let those people keep crossing the border and becoming free in your territory. And so Spain backed off of a policy that they had held since 1693. In 1790, uh, under pressure from Thomas Jefferson, they uh, abolished their religious sanctuary policy in Florida. And if you take it on further uh, into the US uh, territorial period, uh, it's also the case Andrew Jackson is having a fit about uh, slaves running and continuing to run now to uh, uh, many of the Seminole villages as well. And so he launches, uh, you know, an extra legal invasion of Florida, which was Spanish uh, territory at the time in the first so-called Seminole War. And what he's worried about and uh, would not uh, go for was the idea that free blacks were being received into the Seminole villages and that they were allied with Spain. So you had a, a Spanish Seminole and runaway uh, community really in Florida that was just too much of a threat to that plantation system that the US was developing that Andrew sees in full development much later. So uh, no, the American government from the moment it was starting to become a government has been opposed to this idea of allowing a sanctuary in a Spanish territory, whether it's from California, where uh, people of African descent established Los Angeles actually, and I hadn't known that till a friend, Stan Bond, who worked for the National Park Service as the chief archeologist, did a wonderful exhibit about that settlement. But really anywhere you look, Louisiana, Mobile, all of those places had the same legal system that allowed people to become free if on, under certain conditions, um, buying their own freedom, doing a military service for the Spanish government, uh, being freed by their owners. And that's one of the things about the, the sources that uh, my colleagues were all talking about, the wonderful difference in the Spanish sources, that we get the voice of Africans in them that we will not get in another system that considers them only chattel and never thinks of them as human in these uh, civil and criminal cases that have been mentioned, but also in the Catholic Church that documented all these people and all their families and all their social networks through godparentage and other sources. So the church records, which uh, date from the 1590s in the United States, Spanish Florida, um, are also a wonderful source of information about these families. Thank you, Jane. Um, Andrew, I'm going to turn to you and ask you to talk a little bit about the, the archives in Texas that are helpful for, um, for capturing, narrating, describing, um, yeah. representing these histories. It's not something that we've talked about in depth here today, but certainly yeah. something that came up in our past conversations. We've talked a little bit more today about um, the Mexican archives. How about the archival resources available in Texas? Well, there's a, there's a lot of amazing ones in Texas, in part because they have the archives from Mexico <laughs> that were specific to Texas. And I think one of the best examples, and we've talked about this, are known as the Behar Archives, which were the basically the regional archives for far northeastern New Spain and then Mexico, um, that were kept in San Antonio, that have been... Um, microfilms and are available in lots of different forms. In those, what you have are a lot of those kinds of unique records of enslaved people that uh, have been referenced by, by the panelists, which are often depositions. And when enslaved people would run away and be captured by the Spanish military or the Mexican military, typically they would be deposed. Um, not necessarily because, hey, you're an enslaved person, we'd like to know your story, but because they wanted to get information about what's going on, where you walk through, is, is there a military aspect of this we need to know about? They're often asking about different things than I as a scholar would have asked, but what you get is as close to firsthand testimony um, as you're possibly going to get, and what you can see there is absolutely astounding. Um, you also have uh, amazing records in what's known as the Nacogdoches archives um, that are colonial records, specifically in Mexican records uh, for Eastern Texas. And the Dolph Briscoe Center at the University of Texas has an enormous amount of archival materials from Mexico, uh, a lot of which was transcribed in Mexico in the early 20th century. And so there are copies of that at the University of Texas and the, the Benson Center over there. They're just amazing resources. 
And a lot of them touch on aspects of runaway slaves because this became an issue for regional administrators to deal with. It became sometimes debates with the governor of Louisiana in certain cases. And so there's many reasons for them to go back and forth. And what's really interesting there, and we talked about it as a panel, is the ability then to take those sources from the Spanish and Mexican perspectives and then compare them and triangulate them with records from Texas and from the Anglos and sometimes from the Southern United States that gives us a deeper, broader, and more multidimensional story about slavery, enslaved people, and running away than you often can get in the rest of the United States because that kind of multiplicity of records just isn't available. Michaela. Also, uh, to add to Andrew's uh, points, uh, also the Texas State Library and Archives has uh, good information, particularly the governor's papers, where it discusses what governors, uh, people complaining to the governors about enslaved Texans escaping. Also, uh, Texas has invested a lot of uh, money and energy into digitizing a lot of sources. So uh, Kyle Ainsworth's uh, Texas Runaway Slave Project, the portal of Texas history, are also uh, digitized newspapers and uh, digitize sources that can also help people uh, begin to research the, uh, this work with uh, if they're not able to get to Texas. So in some sense, it seems like rather than a paucity of, of information or data, we, you know, there's a lot to go through here and a lot of potential sources that can help people to, to think through these stories. Um, you know, uh, knowing that, and knowing that um, there is tremendous complexity here, which I suppose we can say about just about any aspect of, of, of the past. Um, you know, Andrew, you talked about the ways that the archives can give what you call deeper, broader, and more multidimensional stories. Um, how do we think as panelists, we should be approaching these histories as multidimensional histories, as multi-ethnic and multi-racial histories, as multinational stories? You know, any broad thinking about that that we, we might want to want to discuss together. Jane, maybe I'll turn to you. Well, I, I just love to uh, I've learned a lot from just these last few days of discussion with my colleagues and um, so many of the same patterns. And and I think one of the interesting things that connects Florida and Texas again is, well, Texas and Arkansas and Oklahoma and Florida. <laughs> all the indigenous and African uh, connections where they formed military alliances, families together. And because the US Army is trying to get them out of Florida and get them anywhere else, they send several people out to check out the territory of Arkansas who come back and report and get more of the people signed on to go westward. Where they end up is usually in Oklahoma. And um, then when slave catchers start going for them there, they'll cross the border into Mexico again to Nacimiento. And um, so it's one of the things that I think I've learned a lot from this discussion is how and I also emphasize how geopolitically aware these people were, how multilingual they were, how they knew the politics of Spain, they knew the politics of different indigenous groups, and they knew the politics of the US government and local planners. And um, they always serve as interpreters and middlemen in between these geopolitical fights. And that gives them a certain amount of agency that we wouldn't expect when we're thinking about stories of runaway slaves. Uh, the ones that I'm tracking are really agents in negotiating the best deals they can for their own people, their own allies. Um, it doesn't always turn out well, uh, uh, like Alice's sad story. Sometimes it's betrayal, sometimes it's, you know, death along the way. But other times, you know, these people make it through multiple worlds and survive and leave their records in each of those places. So uh, I think it just gets richer and richer the more we work together and collaborate and use all these sources. Um, I think I've learned a lot and I hope I can contribute by giving the earlier uh, Spanish and indigenous connections to these uh, runaways in Texas as well. Michaela? 
also, uh, this history disrupts or breaks the this idea of a racial uh, binary, just white people and black people who assisted or hindered uh, the efforts of fugitives from slavery in Texas. Uh, there are black people, white people, Mexicans, indigenous populations, and all of them are working sometimes to help uh, a fugitive from slavery, sometimes to make sure that they're not successful, sometimes somewhere in between. So this is really a multi-racial, multi-ethnic story if you choose to study this uh, this history just from the nature of it. Also, um, the incorporation of Spanish language sources. Like you can't really, you could start this history uh, by looking at English sources in the United States, but eventually you would have to include uh, Spanish language sources from either Bayar archives or archives in Mexico City to get the full accurate picture of what was going on because this story is so fascinating and so great because this is a US history and you're tracing the movement of people from the United States into Mexico. And so you mesh the two uh, English and Spanish language sources together to actually figure out uh, what happened. And you do that over and over again to really uh, get the sense of what's going on to recognize larger patterns and how people, uh, how enslaved Texans and uh, enslaved Texans thought about freedom in Mexico and how Mexicans um, at the local level and part of the government received them and thought about uh, the arrival of enslaved people. Andrew, would you like to take a stab at just saying a little bit more about the important, some of the important roles that Native communities played in shaping these histories of freedom seeking in the Texas region? Sure. I mean, I think uh, those who study Texas history have a pretty strong sense of just how diverse the different Indian groups were in Texas and how powerful many of them. The Comanches are the foremost, I think, during a lot of the 19th century in these conversations and how much of that had an influence on Anglos and where they were bringing in and setting up their plantation districts um, and how Mexico thought about Anglo immigration and whether or not to bring in cotton economy and slavery with it, that, that plays a big role in all of this. Um, I know in my conversations with people in the public, there's a common perception that, um, that runaway slaves had a common, had an, often an ally in Native American groups. And there are examples of that, but there's just as many examples of Native American groups capturing uh, runaway slaves and selling them as captives um, to, to people who would ransom them. Um, there's also enslavement amongst Native American groups as well that's going on outside of this system of chattel slavery that is being brought into the territory, which again, gets to that question of, of multi-ethnic, multinational, multi-dimension, all these things are swirling at the same time. And there's a lot of different power groups in the region. And the people who are running away from enslavement are having to navigate all of that, some of which they know about, some of which they can't know about. And when they stab out to the West or Southwest in hopes of perhaps reaching Mexico, you know, they're, they're Going into a landscape that doesn't just have Anglo slave captors behind them, it could have Comanches in the forefront, it could have any number of groups that they might run into who have any number of agendas. And I think that gives us, again, one more pause moment to realize what a daunting challenge it would have been to take on that kind of a risk. Thank you for that. You know, um, the kind of savvy of many of these freedom seekers regarding geopolitics, Jane, as you put it you know, reminds me that we talked quite a bit in our various discussions about the shifting nature of Mexican politics over decades um, and how uh, the shifting nature of internal complications within Mexican politics in the early and mid 19th century was also a feature of this history. So, you know, the broader question I'm asking is how to talk about how complicated all of this is. And it seems to me that it is important to keep our eye on Mexico as a complicated place, a shifting place. And so, Alice, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that and direction that you give, give us as we think about that topic. Absolutely. And Andrew's book is really so, so good at covering how the complicated debates between centralists and federalists were really shaping the Anglo migration into uh, Texas during the Mexican period that is really, really important. The thing that I wanted to mention here is that Mexican politics are messy. There are often changes in who is in charge and what direction the country seems to be going. But by the 1850s, it's remarkable how 
consolidated Mexican politicians seem to be in their rhetoric, not always in practice, but in their rhetoric about anti-slavery, that in 1850, you can find one of the most liberal newspapers in Mexico City publishing a poem from the perspective of an enslaved person in the South. This is imagined uh, extolling Mexico for having promised freedom and legal rights to enslaved people. And you can also find conservative religious newspapers in Guadalajara making the exact same point that Mexico for all of its defeat in the Mexican or the US war with Mexico and in the Texas revolution, that it has this to stand on, this anti-slavery sentiment where Mexico can really stand upright before the world in a way that the United States, according to them, cannot. And so that I think is a really amazing and it, to me it was a very surprising finding to see this sort of burgeoning nationalism in Mexico based around anti-slavery. There's a large historical debate about when nationalism arises in Mexico, and most people, I would say, date it to a later period. But I think we're starting to see some basis of that in this anti-slavery rhetoric that is some of the same rhetoric that is bringing in freedom seekers, that is making them aware of those geopolitical changes and helping them to decide to take the risk to escape to Mexico. So interesting. And, uh, you know, we have a question in the chat that I think we'll try to get to in a few minutes about if people could talk a little bit more about Mexican perspectives on slavery in this period and why um, freedom was even possible in Mexico. Um, and so it'd be nice to kind of drill down on that and, and offer some clarity to those who, who would like a little bit more clarity. But let me shift here from the national, the, in other words, talking about Mexico to talking more locally. Um, you know, we're all interested in place-based histories, of course, and uh, attaching these big stories and individual stories to specific um, places in Texas today. Um, so I, I'd be interested in getting any reflections that you have about how we should be exploring these histories in specific places in Texas today. Where can we see these histories? Where can we explore these histories and document these histories? And Roseanne, maybe I'll turn to you since you've done so much important work um, in your own local area. Thank you, Steve. Um, yes, the, the work that I've been researching down here in the Rio Grande Valley has to do with uh, biracial families that traversed this uh, Texas, traversed the Nueces Strip uh, on their way to Mexico, um, but then kind of stopped short of crossing the river and decided to uh, develop um, their communities here along the Rio Grande um, on the U.S. side. And so um, these, these two particular families, the Webbers out of Travis County and uh, the Jacksons out of Wilcox County, Alabama, um, are, are similar in the sense that, you know, they comprise of a, of a white man, uh, married to, or at least in practice, to uh, an emancipated slave, and then their um, biracial children, and uh, then their children's families as well. Um, and so they're, they're, they're different stories in the sense that they're, the African American peoples in their families were already emancipated slaves, um, but they were still not comfortable where they were living. Uh, the, the Webbers, for example, uh, out of Travis County were, um, you know, dealing with people in the community, um, not, you know, they call it the web, they call it the Weber situation, quote unquote, meaning, well, you know, there's a white man and he was married to the, the slave that he emancipated, Sylvia Hector, uh, and then, you know, with their children uh, that they had together, you know, he was a white man from the East Coast and honored that relationship, um, bought the freedom of Sylvia. And then by the time he was able to procure that freedom, uh, they had three children together. Um, and so, you know, these are unique stories uh, that we have here in, in the state of Texas. And uh, these families, when they came to the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, they were able to purchase large parcels of land 
uh, and develop their own communities and um, and survive on their own. And, and both of these families had uh, licensed ferry landings on their properties. And so, you know, not only were they trading uh, with steamships going up and down the river, but they were also crossing over the river into small communities uh, uh, on the Mexican side. So um, those families, um, certainly when they, they arrived, it was prior to the US Civil War. Uh, you know, unfortunately for these two families in, in February of 1861, Texas became um, a Confederate state and, uh, and therefore uh, was not looking um, very fondly upon these two type of family, you know, these families and in, in their situation. Um, but nonetheless, um, there were pathways across the state of Texas. And we talked about this earlier uh, in the week with the panelists uh, talking about what the Underground Railroad looked like in Texas and, and trying to close our eyes and imagine what that, that was. And you know, the, this particular event called you know, the Network to Freedom um, project through the, um, through the National Park Service um, allows us to investigate that. And so, um, you know, I had suggested maybe talking about this in terminology of calling it perhaps pathways to freedom. And so, you know, um, I know that the National Park Service did a, a, a similar event back in 2000 where they came up with this uh, map, which uh, turned out, uh, you know, is very similar to the Camino Real map and how, you know, um, uh, enslaved peoples uh, seeking freedom would, would traverse that route and try to cross over into Mexico. We've heard from Jane that there's a, uh, you know, the, the, the Brackettville and uh, Nacimiento de los Negros um, trail uh, where, you know, the Florida Seminoles were, were, were coming across in, into Texas and, and, uh, and seeking freedom across the border there. Um, but, you know, the stories that I, I study are, are more uh, intimate, if you will, because I'm, I'm studying particular families, um, learning about um, other histories through oral history interviews and other, other reports done by um, people like myself down here, but you know, decades before trying to capture these histories before people um, were passing away and not able to talk about it with, with um, certainty. So, um, um, you know, that's, that's where we, we value these histories and uh, we need to keep uh, those histories going and we need to um, uh, highlight these different pathways because there were plenty of ways to cross the river. Um, you know, it's a very long border. Uh, even if you thought about it in terms of, um, uh, military forts. You have Fort Brown in Brownsville, and then 100 miles upriver, you have Fort Ringgold in Rio Grande City, and then another 100 miles upriver, you have Fort McIntosh, and so forth and so on. So there's a lot of space in between where these um, freedom seekers could find freedom uh, by traversing yet a different pathway. And that's what I, uh, I talk about when I talk about the Webbers coming down from Travis County, um, John Weber was a seasoned trader uh, crossing the Nuesta Strip uh, many, many times with his, uh, his uh, neighbors and, and, uh, and fellow traders, um, you know, fending off Native American attacks, uh, passing himself off as a doctor so that he could, um, you know, successfully maneuver places um, uh, on the south side of the river as he was trying to quote unquote trade tobacco uh, with, uh, with peoples there. And um, so, you know, there was, there's all these little stories and then um, you can go through, uh, you know, I know that um, uh, the other panelists have mentioned a lot of really great archives. Um, and you know, for me, because I'm trying to pinpoint specific names and specific events with specific family members, you know, I could get very excited when I find something in, let's say, you know, the 
one of the library, the Texas A&M library, where I found the annals, uh, I'm sorry, the annals of uh, um, um, Austin history, uh, Frank Brown papers that um, talk about, they mention John Weber, they mention runaway slaves, they mention an, a, a date, an event, six slaves on horseback left Bastrop and were captured in San Antonio and returned, or 20 slaves were captured. These are all in those papers. These are specific events that, um, that we can look to. So with regard to um, Underground Railroad activity, like or Underground Railroad-like activity passing through the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, you know, we can specifically point to the Jackson family where there is still a, uh, a family church and uh, two graveyards. And then with the Weber family, uh, although the ranch does not exist anymore, there is a family graveyard there, uh, which uh, has a very close vantage point to the actual river. And so, um, you know, we feel that this is, these are important sites that need to be highlighted and, uh, you know, and have attention brought to them. Thanks, Roseanne. Those, those local stories are so critical to this work. Andrew, let me turn it over to you. I was just gonna um, build real fast on what Roseanne said about, so she's talking about the you know, Rio Grande Valley and the connections there. And what I love about these, these records that we're talking about and some of the narratives that you can find in the Spanish and Mexican sources is that you can, you can see it on the landscape and it sometimes reframes things that are very familiar stories in Texas history, or at least people, the way they tend to understand them. Um, so Alice, uh, earlier in the program, told a story that started in, in uh, on the coast with uh, Louisiana um, with the consul. I, I want to tell a quick story that kind of builds on that. It's, and it comes from these, these, these Mexican archives and the records of enslaved people there. But there were uh, three enslaved people named Richard, Marion, and Phoebe who were living in Western Louisiana on the plantation of a cotton planter named James Kirkham. And he was by their account, as we know from the records, um, an awful person who was incredibly violent. And so they decided in 1819, late 1819, to abandon the plantation and they took off. They stole a horse and a mule and they took off running. And where they went are these locations we can point to now in Texas, right? They crossed the Sabine River and they're following the Camino Real and as they're going along, they get to Nacogdoches where they run into a Spanish military detachment and they, they turn themselves in because they, they think this is gonna be a better situation for them. And so that Spanish military detachment brings them down to San Antonio where they're you know, interviewed a little bit and then they're shipped down to Monterey um, in Nueva Leon. And in all of that, they get to give their own testimony and have their own um, perspectives of this. And we have locations of them on all these different places. And we can put that on the ground in places like uh, in Texas on these certain landscapes that we already know about. But it helps again, reframe these bigger questions and stories that we are familiar with because James Kirkham, when he found out these guys had run away, starts to come after them. And he gets a letter from the governor of Louisiana to come try to reclaim them. And he's coming into Texas in, in 1820. And as he's coming in, he meets up with another traveler who's coming into Texas, whose name was Moses Austin. And so, when Moses Austin comes into Texas in 1820, he's accompanying a man named James Kirkham, who is in pursuit of runaway slaves into Texas. And I think that points to a much bigger, broader story about Texas during this period that leads to ultimately 1865 in ways that we haven't had a chance to talk about that you can find on the ground, much as Roseanne's talking about in these localized places and localized stories. Thanks for that. Very much, Andrew. I've been trying to pull questions from the Q and A as I can and fit them in, um, uh, and, and pitch them to our, our panelists as we go. And now I'm going to do that a bit more formally. Uh, we have a number of, of questions in the in the Q and A, and so I'm going to try to get to as many of them as I can. And one of the things I'm trying to do is kind of cluster them together and turn three questions into one. Um, we have a few questions um, about how to understand Black freedom seekers from the United States who make it to Mexico in the context of Mexican history. And so one way to put this um, would be to ask the panelists, how do the history of freedom seekers who arrive in Mexico fit into the broader history of Afro-Mexicans or black people 
um, in Mexico over time, in the 19th century in particular maybe, or, but maybe perhaps over a longer span of time. Uh, Michaela, do you have a observation? So uh, for many people uh, who study Mexican history or who are Mexican, they think that black people exist in Veracruz and Costa Chica and Oaxaca and mainly just in these areas. So uh, the arrival of freedom seekers and their descendants uh, in, in Northern Mexico thinks about uh, blackness in Mexico as being more expansive as opposed to concentrated in these localized uh, areas. Also, it moves away from um, slavery as the reason or uh, that black people were in uh, enslavement as the reason why black people were in Mexico. And in this case, uh, looking at how Mexico offered freedom or uh, an opportunity for a kind of freedom to black people. And so it really um, um, makes you think more about uh, freedom as a, as a attracting uh, attractor to Mexico as opposed to slavery as the reason why black people uh, or and their descendants are uh, were in Mexico or are in Mexico. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have another question or set of questions actually that are um, I think suggesting people would be interested in hearing more about why Mexico even offered freedom or manumission to enslaved people in the United States, or what the status of these debates uh, about enslavement were across the early 19th century. What was shaping those debates? Um, is it fair to say that Mexico was a less racist place um, for black people or would that, is that not the same as saying that this is a place that did not have formal enslavement on the style of the United States? Alice, maybe I'll turn to you on that. Absolutely. So the question of why Mexico passed these laws was really one of the questions that made me write this book and research it for eight years. Um, and it's a really complicated one. During the Mexican War for Independence, there was a link that was forged in the popular imagination between individual emancipation and national independence. And this is something that also happened in the American Revolution, that in the wake of that American Revolution, as in Mexico, there's this feeling that by declaring independence as a nation, that that really called into question the legitimacy of human slavery. And so I think that there is a anti-slavery movement that begins, or anti-slavery sentiment in Mexico that begins with antecedents, of course, before Mexico's war for independence, but that really has uh, jump starts during that war for independence in the same way that it happens in the United States in the wake of the American Revolution. It's no coincidence, however, that Mexico abolished slavery in 1837, which is a year after the Texas Revolution and six weeks after the United States extended diplomatic recognition to the Republic of Texas. By abolishing slavery in 1837, Mexico basically was able was doing a was was able to show or was able to suggest that although it had been it had lost texas that it was standing for freedom while the republic of texas as andrew's book shows so beautifully had passed a constitution that basically protected slavery from ever being interfered with by the legislature ever again and so they're drawing this contrast between free mexico and the slaveholding republic. And it's really adding fuel to the fire for abolitionists in the United States who are arguing that the Texas Revolution was a slaveholders revolt. And it's making it harder for places like England to extend diplomatic recognition to the Republic of Texas, although they, of course, um, that doesn't last forever. So there is a certainly a dimension of abolition that very much has to do with larger geopolitics. During the, or in the, at, in the wake of the Texas Revolution, the Republic of Texas uh, is trying to establish its independence. It's trying to create a thriving financial system, uh, which it has a very hard time doing. And the promise of freedom in Mexico, in addition to being this larger geopolitical um, advantage to Mexico, it, the promise of freedom in Mexico also holds out hope to enslaved people in Texas. If they could revolt or run away, the Mexican politicians are thinking, well, maybe that will make it impossible for the Republic of Texas to remain independent. So there are these larger geopolitical questions that are at play. That doesn't necessarily explain why it is that we see Mexican citizens and Mexican officials 
in northeastern Mexico, helping to defend freedom seekers from enslavers from Texas and Louisiana who are trying to kidnap them. I, have, I would love to share some of the stories of those, uh, those events. But that question, why is it that an old man who employs an, a formerly enslaved woman in Reynosa, why does he fight against her kidnappers in 1850 when they try to kidnap her and her child? Why is that? And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the United States had conquered half of Mexico's territory, seized it in an unjust war. And here again, the Yankees were coming down and trying to seize people who had become part of Mexican communities who had established a claim to freedom in Mexico and who were violating Mexican sovereignty. So there are sort of two levels at which we could think about anti-slavery in Mexico and the reasons for it, both at the sort of national level and at the very local level. Thanks, Alice. I want to, um, we're going to close this section of the program in a couple of minutes, but I wanted to give our panelists the opportunity to say a, a final word, if you each have one, about kind of where you see all of this going. Clearly one critical, important um, set of activities, and the reason we're all here is because we, we need to attach these histories to places and um, con contribute to efforts by people on this call uh, to do just that work in the NPS and in other organizations. Uh, but you're also scholars who've uh, uh, made important archival discoveries, um, uh, written important things, and you can also see the future of the field in other ways based on your vantage point, again, as scholars and as, as educators, as people who do work in the public. So I'd love to hear any thoughts that you have about where you think these conversations are going, where you'd like to see them go based on the, the work that you've done to date, maybe based in part on our discussions over the last few days. And, and maybe we can end it there uh, with, a, with a brief word from, from each of you, and then we'll turn it back over to, to Justin and others at NPS. Uh, who'd like to go first? So um, this field is emerging. Uh, we are sort of uh, us and there's a few other people working on the, this history. So I'm really excited to see where it goes. Uh, people who studied uh, fugitives from slavery who escaped to the north. Um, that's like people are still discovering things in the, on the East Coast. And so since we're just getting started, there's so much more to uncover and write about and explore. And so I think that the direction uh, that that this is going to go in is that more people will learn about it and become interested in it and begin to explore the many aspects of um, in fugitives from slavery who uh, were in Texas, their experiences, what it was like, what it was like to escape through Texas, what it was like to be in Mexico um, to broaden our understanding of fugitives from slavery in North America as opposed to just the United States. And I think as, as we see the current map um, given uh, or provided by the National Park Service on their Network to Freedom uh, website, uh, there's so few locations in Texas. I think we just have one in Brackettville. Uh, it's very important for us. Clearly, there's a lot of research and, um, and scholarship that has been written about this. Um, you know, and I've learned a tremendous amount in the last three days from from my esteemed colleagues. So there, there's there's no reason why we can't add more, more spots on the map absolutely here in Texas. Um, but we have to think about and consider and make sure that when we tell these stories of, of um, freedom seekers and, and from Texas and moving on into Mexico and to freedom in Mexico, that we make sure that we um, include all the peripheral events and, 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 and everything that has to do with, you know, what caused a uh, freedom seeker to take this pathway to freedom, what was happening at that particular point in time. And so, you know, we did talk a lot about um, prior to tonight's open house, we talked about a lot about, especially um, the year 1850, 1855, where there was a lot of things going on uh, with regard to, um, you know, politics and, um, and, and uh, uh, you know, Native American peoples and uh, slave catchers and, and expeditions and, and things that would have caused um, a, a person like John Weber not to continue on into Mexico during his 
on his normal route, which would have taken him to a place like uh, across Brackenville, Piedras Negras, or even down into Nacimiento de los Negros, what you know caused him to push for much further east and come down in this direction. And so, you know, we had a lot of slave catchers out there, a lot of expeditions happening at the time that they were aware of. Um, you know, so we need to co continue this research and this collaboration and make sure that we create a clear picture. You know, we didn't even, we didn't really touch on religion uh, in tonight's um, events. And, and the, the, the other family that I researched, the Jackson family, and, and you know, the, how, how much they clung to their religion and their, their passion to help others um, and, and their establishment of their church, which it, it's still standing today, and people can go visit it. So these are, um, you know, we have to consider uh, wrapping our arms around the entire story and, and, and making sure we tell it in, in a clear and concise manner. I'm really excited for more research about freedom seekers escaping by waterways. There are many more instances of, in, in the Louisiana archives of enslaved people being caught in the holds of ships like Jean Antoine. And I think it's just a fascinating thing to explore further. So wanted to suggest that we have a lot more that we can do between the Florida landscape, the Texas landscape, all those middle areas, you know, through the southern tier and then on to California and that maybe this work that everybody's generating in at least Florida and Texas will inspire some other scholars in those states as well to fill in, uh, you know, the, as Michaela said, the North American experience uh, even before it was the United States. There's so many of these same kinds of records in all those places, just need to pull it all together and then maybe we'll have another uh, conference with everybody filling in those blanks as well. Sad real quickly. Uh, I think that there's so much there's so many resources that we need to mine more deeply and try to understand with the, the breadth of, of what they can offer us. Like, as Michaela mentioned, um, Kyle Ainsworth's Texas Runaway Slave Ad Project that is an immense resource that we barely touched the surface on what we can do with the, those resources that Kyle put together. Um, and the thing I hope that the field does is that we embrace the, the messiness and the complexity of these stories, that it isn't just a story of you know, good guys running away and bad guys trying to catch them, that there's all these, and that's happening, but there's all these different players from the Comanches to the Mexican population that lives in Texas that have different perspectives at different moments and different times. And that that's a really messy story. And embracing that complexity, I think, is really hard, but really important for us to get a very honest accounting of what freedom seeking looked like in a place like Texas. Well, thank you all. I think that's as good a place as any to, to stop. I, you know, panelists, I, I so appreciate your, your generosity and your expertise on these topics. And so let me just thank on behalf of the panelists, everyone, again, who's made this event possible in the National Park Service and the Organization of American Historians. This for me anyway, has been a really exciting event. It's been a really exciting few days. It's clear that there's a lot more to do to advance this important work. And so I'll just urge everybody here uh, to keep your eyes open to the future publications of these scholars on the panel. And, and of course, to the efforts of the Network to Freedom and other important organizations around the country. Let's let's support their work, especially. And I'm now going to turn things over to Justin Henderson. Justin, thank you, Stephen, uh, and thank you, uh, thank you all for spending this evening of information sharing with us. And thank you to Stephen and our team of scholars, as well as thank you to Dr. Stanton uh, and Diane and our team at the Organization of American Historians. Uh, my name is Justin Henderson, and I'm the program. I'm the Heritage Partnerships Program Manager for the National Park Service. Interior Region 6, 7, and 8 that serves Texas. Our Regional Heritage Partnerships Program Office supports those who preserve significant historic places by providing innovative ideas, professional expertise, and other preservation assistance services. Uh, you know, in, in reviewing uh, a number of the questions that we had tonight, uh, there was a lot of talk about this academic discussion and how do we translate that on, into on-the-ground actions, like potential new uh, designations and recognition of historic sites, interpretation and outreach programs, heritage documentation, and continuing to engage more diverse groups of stakeholders and descendants. Uh, we certainly can't address the complexities of these transnational and multiracial stories of freedom seeking in just one open house or one scholars roundtable. 
Rather, we're really hoping that this helps uh, raise awareness and starts the process of building new relationships and opportunities to work together. Uh, hosting this open house really ho hopefully drive that discussion. You know, our, our regional office of the National Park Service and the larger uh, Network to Freedom program stand ready to help you and your communities with uh, potential designations uh, and, uh, and, and resources like that. Uh, we've posted in the chat box uh, a reference for you for some of those additional materials. Uh, so to really help continue to facilitate this dialogue, uh, we have posted in the meeting chat box uh, a document that includes key contact information as well as the references to National Park Service Network to Freedom program and numerous National Park Service grant programs that can help support the preservation and stewardship of historic places in your community. Our regional heritage partnerships program hopes to cultivate new connections with you and explore new opportunities to support local historic preservation efforts. Uh, studying and sharing the complexities of the Underground Railroad and the history of freedom seeking in Texas provides unique opportunities to explore both uh, the national as well as international implications of this legacy. Again, thank you for your participation at tonight's events and we look forward to working with you in the future. And this concludes uh, tonight's program.